Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and I'm here today with Henry. Hi. And welcome back, everybody. We're finally back, right, Henry? Yep. After our little two-week break and two-week vacation, we are back with our next Vice Presidential Series installment, and we're taking a look at what number of Vice President, Henry? The ninth. The ninth Vice President of the United States, the man behind us. What's his name, Henry? Richard Mentor. Johnson? That's right, you got it right. Richard Mentor Johnson, the ninth vice president. We got some cool things to tell you about Richard Mentor Johnson, but first, before we do that, we didn't forget our routine. Henry, tell the people what they need to do. Hit subscribe down below, and leave all your questions. Comments and questions. Comments and questions, and hit the bell. There you go. It's been a while, it's I know. <laughs> Hit subscribe down below. Leave all those comments and questions. We love those. Hit the little notification bell so you can be notified when we do release a new video, which moving forward again is going to be... Every single week. Every single week. That's right. So now sit back and relax because we're going to get into the man behind us, the ninth Vice President of the United States, Richard Mentor Johnson, and this is... Dead History. Dead History. Hey guys, TJ back with you, here with Henry. Hello. And I want to take this time real quick to of course say welcome back, like we said. Yes. Welcome back to all our audience and our subscribers. We are back and we're so happy to be back. Thank you for the understanding of letting us have a little break because we've been going nonstop for the last year or so. So yes. <laughs> it was nice to have a little break. But welcome back. Also, I want to take this time real quick for two big shout outs. The first shout out, during our break of the two weeks when we were away, we had a really special birthday on October 18th. It was Henry's eighth birthday. So very big, happy birthday, Henry. Hope you had a wonderful day, of course. And another birthday today, actually, the day that we're filming this is one of our very, very good, great, wonderful su subscribers from over in the UK, over in England, Les. Happy birthday, Les. Yes. Hope you have a wonderful day, buddy. So, now we're going to get into the ninth vice president, right? The guy behind us here? Yeah, the guy behind us right there. Richard Mentor Johnson. Some cool things about Richard Mentor Johnson. Something very interesting. He was actually married in a common law marriage to an enslaved woman that his father actually owned as an enslaved woman. Her name was Julia Chin. And... Richard Mentor Johnson and Julia had two children together. Yeah, pretty crazy stuff. I'm going to get into all that with you. He led a very interesting and somewhat controversial life, Richard Mentor Johnson. Another cool thing about Richard Mentor Johnson, he was actually a pallbearer at Daniel Boone's funeral when Daniel Boone was reinterred at the Frankfurt Cemetery in Frankfurt, Kentucky. Pretty cool stuff. Yep. And what's cool about that is Richard Mentor Johnson is buried in Frankfurt Cemetery, maybe only like 30 or 40 yards from where Daniel Boone was reinterred. So they're real close to each other, too. So it's a pretty cool, fun fact. We're going to get into all that, of course. So they did the likes, right? They did. Do we remember all this? Do we know how to do it? Yes. They did the likes. They did, they did the subscribes. Yes. Comments and questions, hopefully, right? Yes. Henry, take it away. Tell them what they gotta go get. Go we'll get the potato chips, the soda, the popcorn, and the pretzels. <laughs> That's right. Whatever you like to snack chips. on. That's right. It's Halloween, so maybe candy corn yes, or yes. gummy bears or Snickers or Snickers. whatever it is, right? Yep. Go get it all, because here we go. We're gonna get into our next vice presidential series installment after a two-week break, taking a look at. The ninth vice president of the United States. What's his name, Henry? Richard Mentor Johnson. Very good. Richard Mentor Johnson. Sit back, relax, and, and enjoy. enjoy. Hey, guys. Welcome. TJ here with Dead History. And welcome back, everybody. Welcome back after our little... Uh, two-week break. Yeah, our two-week break, right? Our little uh, hiatus. Uh, Henry and I are back. I'm here with Henry, of course. Say hi. Hello. And welcome back, everybody, for our next Vice Presidential Series installment. And we're taking a look at what number, Henry? 
The ninth. The ninth vice president of the United States, Richard Mentor Johnson. And Henry's here. He's uh, going to be leaving me, uh, you know, so I'll be alone for the audio. But Henry wanted to say hi. Hello. And welcome back, right? Yep. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the big uh, eight-year-old boy here, Henry. Um, so, yeah, so uh, we're going to get into uh, Richard Mentor Johnson today. Of course, we know what part one is. Part one's going to be his early life, childhood, that sort of thing, rise in the political ranks all the way up to his vice presidency. And then part two, we'll talk about the vice presidency, his legacy, and his death and burial site. So, Henry, come here. Let me ask you. Can you, let me see if I can quiz you. What state was Richard Mentor Johnson from? I'll give you a hint. It begins with a K. I don't know. You don't know? Kentucky. Very good. Say it again. Kentucky. Kentucky. That's right. He was born in Kentucky, died in Kentucky, and buried in Kentucky. So good job. All right, Henry, I know you're going to be getting out of here, and you're not going to be joining me for the rest of the audio, so... Say hi and bye to everybody. Hello. <laughs> Say bye-bye. You'll see everybody uh, next week or so. All right, bye. <laughs> All right, guys. So here we go. We're going to jump into the ninth vice president of the United States, Richard Mentor Johnson. Hey, guys. Welcome. Uh, obviously, you just heard a little introduction from uh, Henry and myself, of course. Uh, now we're going to kind of just jump right in here. We're going to be taking a look, of course, our next vice presidential series installment at the ninth vice president, Richard Mentor Johnson. Uh, a lot of things to go over with uh, Johnson. Uh, will be two parts, of course, like I said. Uh, first part, we're going to kind of get into his early life. And then uh, after that, I'm probably leading all the way up right to his vice presidency. And then uh, we'll, we'll tackle that information in part two. Uh, have some really awesome things to bring you with Richard Mentor Johnson. Have a very, very special treat uh, regarding uh, Richard Mentor Johnson. So uh, very, very excited uh, to bring this to you guys. Uh, so let's jump right in here. The United States Senate elected Richard Mentor Johnson of Kentucky the nation's ninth vice president, on February 8th of 1837. His selection marked the first and only time the Senate had exercised its prerogative under the U.S. Constitution's 12th Amendment, which provides, if no person have a majority, then from the two highest numbers on the list, the Senate shall choose the vice president. Johnson became Martin Van Buren's running mate after three decades in the House and Senate, a congressional career spanning the administrations of five presidents from Thomas Jefferson through Andrew Jackson. Detractors alleged, however, that he owed his nomination solely to the dubious claim that he killed the Shawnee chieftain Tecumseh in 1813 at the Battle of the Thames. Johnson wielded substantial power in the House of Representatives during Jackson's two administrations, and his successful decade-long campaign to end imprisonment for debt won him a national following. For most of his career, the voters of his district held him in great esteem. They forgave him when he sponsored the 1816 Compensation Act, one of the most unpopular laws ever enacted by Congress, as well as on more than one occasion when he lined his own pockets with government funds. During the 1836 presidential campaign and Johnson's single term as vice president, however, his popularity dissipated. The plain manners and habits that had once endeared him to his constituents and supporters combined with his controversial personal life and unfortunate penchant for lending his influence in support of questionable undertakings proved serious liabilities. A campaign to remove him from the Democratic ticket in 1840 failed only because Van Buren 
while no Johnson enthusiast was unwilling to alienate the Eastern labor vote and because party leaders were reluctant to force a potentially divisive confrontation. The 1840 election, resulting in a decisive victory for the Whig ticket headed by Johnson's former comrade-in-arms, William Henry Harrison, signaled the end of the Kentuckians' long and often controversial career. Little is known of Richard Mentor Johnson's early years. 19th century campaign biographies and a modern study based on these earlier accounts are heavily colored by the heroic rhetoric that Johnson and his supporters employed throughout his career. Although he was, as he later claimed, born in a cane break and cradled in a sap trough, the Johnsons were a powerful family of substantial means. The future vice president was born on October 17th of 1780 at Beargrass, a Virginia frontier outpost near the site of present-day Louisville, Kentucky. His father, Robert Johnson, had migrated from Orange County, Virginia with his wife, Jemima Suget or Suget Johnson in 1779. By 1812, Robert Johnson was one of the largest landholders in Kentucky. He served in the Virginia House of Burgesses, attended both the 1785 convention that petitioned the Virginia legislature for Kentucky statehood and the 1792 Kentucky Constitutional Convention and represented his district in the state legislature for several years after Kentucky's admission to the Union. After three of Richard Mentor Johnson's brothers achieved national office, James and John Telemachus served in the House of Representatives and Benjamin was a federal district judge. Critics charged that the family sought power in every hole and corner of the state. The Johnsons proved remarkably effective in obtaining government contracts and others, other favors for family members and allies, and their financial interests in local newspapers such as Amos Kendall's Georgetown Minerva and the Georgetown Patriot added to their considerable influence. Richard Mentor Johnson received enough of an early education to qualify him for apprenticeships reading law under Kentucky jurists George Nicholas and James Brown, both former students of Thomas Jefferson's legendary teacher, George Wythe. The allusions that flavor his letters and speeches suggest at least a passing familiarity, familiarity with the classics. After his admission to the bar in 1802, he returned to the family's home near Great Crossings, Kentucky to practice law. He later operated a retail store at Great Crossings and engaged in other business and speculative ventures with brothers James, Benjamin, and Joel. These efforts, together with a sizable bequest of land and slaves from his father, eventually made Johnson a wealthy man although he never identified with the privileged classes. He, routine, routine, ah, he routinely waived legal fees for the indigent land claimants he represented in suits against wealthy speculators, and his home was a mecca for disabled veterans, widows, and orphans seeking his assistance. No one was refused hospitality at Blue Spring Farm, his estate near Great Crossings. An acquaintance heard men say they were treated so well by Colonel Johnson when they went out there, they loved to go. Early accounts describe the future vice president as a gentle and personable man with a pleasant, if nondescript, appearance. Washington socialite Margaret Bayard Smith found him the most tender-hearted, mild, affectionate, and benevolent of men whose countenance beams with goodwill to all. 
whose soul seems to feed on the milk of human kindness. He might have been a fashionable man, she speculated, if not for his retiring nature in plain dress and manners. He possessed, in the words of John C. Calhoun's biographer, Charles M. Wiltsey, the rare quality of being personally liked by everyone. From 1804 to 1806, Johnson served as a delegate from Scott County in the Kentucky House of Representatives, where he supported legislation to protect settlers from land speculators. Elected to the United States House of Representatives from the district encompassing Shelby, Scott, and Franklin counties in 1806, he served six consecutive terms, retiring from the House in 1819 to seek election to the Senate. Throughout his career, Johnson professed allegiance to the principles of Thomas Jefferson, the patriarch of republicanism, and correspondence from his early years in Congress suggests that he enjoyed a cordial acquaintance with Jefferson. In a rambling letter of February of 1808, Johnson recommended a candidate for federal office and assured the president that, I feel in you a confidence and attachment which is indescribable and can never be excelled. Having procured the books mentioned in the mem memorandum from you, the young congressman suggested a course of historical reading would be greatly received. The acquaintance continued uh, after Jefferson's retirement. In 1813, Johnson wrote that he constantly recollected how much mankind are indebted to you, adding somewhat self-consciously that, I make no apologies for indulging feelings which I really feel. During the War of 1812, he apprised the retired president of military developments and solicited his counsel. As to the manner of reading and the books to read, particularly as it respects military history. As the representative of a frontier, predominantly agrarian district, Johnson shared his constituents' concern for the security of the interior settlements, as well as their inherent distrust of bankers, speculators, and other moneyed interests. An administration man with respect to defense and foreign policy matters, he voted against Secretary of the Treasury Albert Gallatin's proposal to recharter the Bank of the United States during the Madison administration. Great moneyed monopolies, he explained much later, controlled by persons irresponsible to the people are liable to exercise a dangerous influence in corporate bodies generally, especially when they have the power to affect the circulating medium of the country, do not well comport with genius of a republic. He was a hard-working representative, popular among the voters of his district, but otherwise undistinguished, until his heroism in the War of 1812 brought him national acclaim. Johnson was one of the vociferous young congressmen, led by his fellow Kentuckian House Speaker Henry Clay, known collectively as the Warhawks. During the 12th Congress, this group urged military redress for British violations of American frontiers and shipping rights, and in June of 1812, they voted to declare war against Great Britain. Not wishing to be idle during the recess of Congress, Johnson raised and led two mounted regiments that joined the Northwestern Army under the command of his future rival, General William Henry Harrison, in the fall of 1813. Johnson's Kentucky Volunteers crossed the Canadian border in pursuit of a combined British and Shawnee force led by General Henry Proctor and overran the enemy position at the Thames River on October 5th of 1813. A heroic cavalry charge led by Johnson and his brother James ensured a decisive American victory in which Tecumseh, 
the Shawnee leader who had preyed upon American settlements in the Northwest since 1806, was among the presumed casualties. Although his remains were never identified, some witness claimed after the fact that Johnson had killed Tecumseh. Johnson returned to Congress a hero on March 7th of 1814, still suffering from the extensive wounds that plagued him for the rest of his life. He turned his attention to war-related matters, the relief of veterans, widows and orphans, the compensation of veterans for service-related property losses, and the improvement of the young nation's military establishment. Johnson's newfound popularity and his characteristic willingness to accede to his constituents' demands ensured his political survival through the fervor over the 1816 Compensation Act, which for the first time granted members of Congress an annual salary, rather than paying them only for the days Congress was in session. The, the measure became controversial when a newspaper estimated that the new system would cost the government an additional $400,000 annually, and Congress repealed the law the next year. Although Johnson sponsored the bill, he quickly repudiated the measure after the public outcry cost many of his colleagues their seats. His nationalist perspective heightened by the war, Johnson joined with Henry Clay in advocating protection for frontier products and federal funding for internal improvements to give Western producers readier access to Eastern markets. In 1817, Johnson voted to override Madison's veto of the bonus bill, a proposal to fund internal improvements from the bonus and dividends from the Bank of the United States. Widely regarded as an expert in military affairs, as a consequence of his valor under fire, Johnson was one of several Westerners whom President James Monroe considered to head the War Department after Henry Clay declined the post in 1817. The nomination ultimately went to John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, but Johnson enjoyed considerable leverage over the department as chairman from 1817 to 1819 of the House Committee on Expenditures in the Department of War. In 1818, Calhoun authorized an expedition to plant a military outpost at the mouth of the Yellowstone River, near the current site of Buford, North Dakota, and awarded the transportation and supply contract to the chairman's brother and partner, James Johnson. The Yellowstone expedition departed from St. Louis just as the Panic of 1819 brought post-war economic expansion to a halt and shortly before Treasury Secretary William H. Crawford issued a December 1819 report projecting a $5 million budget deficit. The venture grossly exceeded anticipated costs, in large part because of James Johnson's malfeasance and Richard Mentor Johnson's repeated pleas for further advances. As a result, the expedition provided Calhoun's enemies in Congress with potent ammunition for an attack that ultimately led to drastic reductions in the War Department budget. After Johnson requested yet another contract for James in the summer of 1820, Calhoun finally advised the president that, to avoid all censure, the contracts ought to be made on public proposals. Johnson retired from the House long before the Yellowstone expedition stalled at Council Bluffs, Iowa, but the eventual outcry over the venture failed to diminish his stature in Kentucky. As Monroe had earlier acknowledged, the people of the whole Western country considered the expedition a measure to preserve the peace of the frontier. The local press celebrated the Herculean undertakings of the Johnsons while accusing their critics of political animosity. On December 10th of 1819, 
Sorry about that. I had to clear my throat. On December 10th of 1819, the Kentucky legislature elected Johnson to fill the unexpired portion of John J. Crittenden's Senate term. Richard Mentor Johnson began his Senate career heavily in debt. He mortgaged several properties to the Bank of the United States to settle accounts outstanding from the Yellowstone Expedition and other speculative ventures. In 1822, Bank Counsel Henry Clay won a substantial judgment against the Johnson brothers. Still, Johnson weathered the Depression better than many of, of his constituents and others who were left destitute after the Panic of 1819 severely depressed credit and agricultural prices. Thousands of overextended farmers and laborers found themselves pressed by increasingly frantic creditors during the Depression that followed the panic. Imprisonment for debt was a common punishment in state and local courts during the early 19th century, although few debtors were incarcerated for outstanding federal obligations. Both Johnson's own experience and the suffering in his district and elsewhere convinced him that the principle is deemed too dangerous to be tolerated in a free government. To permit a man for any pecuniary consideration to dispose of the liberty of his equal. The movement to end debt imprisonment began long before Johnson. On December 10th of 1822, introduced a bill, a Senate bill, to abolish use of the punishment by federal courts. He did, however, become one of the acknowledged leaders of the effort, first through his success in persuading the Kentucky legislature to abolish the practice in 1821, and then with his decade-long campaign in Congress that in 1832 achieved enactment of a federal statute. Senator Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri later explained that the impact of the 1832 law extended far beyond the federal courts. In the force of examples and influence, the statute led to the secession of the practice of imprisoning debtors in all or nearly all of the states and territories of the Union. A second legislative accomplishment that brought Johnson national distinction was a report that he had prepared during his final Senate term as chairman of the Committee on Post Offices and Post Roads. In response to a flood of petitions from religious congregations in the East demanding the suspension of Sunday mail deliveries. The January 19, 1829 report, widely reprinted in the press, argued that as a civil and not a religious institution, the government could take no action sanctioning the religious convictions or practices of any denomination. After leaving the Senate, Johnson continued his crusade as a member of the House of Representatives. In 1830, as chairman of the House Committee on Post Offices and Post Roads, he submitted a second report. This, like the earlier Senate report, brought him widespread acclaim in the labor press as a champion of religious liberty. Some contemporaries doubted Johnson's authorship of the second report, however, and his biographer has conceded that Johnson's friends in the post office department, including his landlord, O.B. Brown, may have influenced his stance. During his 10 years in the Senate, from 1819 to 1829, Johnson gravitated toward the coalition then emerging under the skilled leadership of Martin Van Buren that eventually became the Democratic Party, as well as toward the party's future standard bearer, Andrew Jackson. The acquaintance dated at least from 1814 when Johnson wrote to Jackson at New Orleans to recommend a supply contractor. He was Jackson's impassioned, if ineffective, defender in 1819 when Clay urged the House of Representatives to censure the general for his execution of two British subjects during the Seminole War. 
Senator Johnson declared for Jackson after the 1824 presidential election was thrown into the House of Representatives. And by some accounts, after the candidate hinted that, if elected, he intended to name Johnson Secretary of War. When the House elected John Quincy Adams president, Johnson broke the news to Jackson that the new president had named as Secretary of State Henry Clay, who had voted for Adams in spite of the Kentucky voters' clear preference for Jackson. Johnson was absent when the Senate approved Clay's nomination on March 7th of 1825. A Washington journalist later reported that, after the election, Johnson determined to enter the ranks of the opposition. He had become, and would remain for the rest of his life, a steadfast Jacksonian. Johnson was re-elected to a full Senate term in 1822, but in 1828 he lost his re-election bid because Kentucky Democrats feared that controversy over his domestic life would jeopardize Jackson's chances in the national election. Johnson never married. Family tradition recounts that he ended an early romance vowing revenge for his mother's interference after Jemima Johnson pronounced his intended bride unworthy of the family. He later lived openly with Julia Chin, a mulatto slave raised by his mother and inherited from his father until her death from cholera in 1833. Johnson freely acknowledged the relationship as well as the two daughters born to the union and entrusted Julia with full authority over his business affairs during his absences from Blue Spring Farm. The relationship provoked little comment in Johnson's congressional district, but as a member of the Senate with an expanded constituency, he was vulnerable to criticism by large slaveholders and others who disapproved of open miscegenation. Threatened press exposure of the senator's personal life during the 1828 campaign unnerved Jackson's supporters in the Kentucky legislature. They therefore attempted to dissociate the national candidate from the now controversial Johnson, joining forces with the Adams faction to oppose Johnson's re-election and ultimately forcing state legislator John Telemachus Johnson to withdraw his brother's name from the contest. The defeat ended Johnson's Senate career. In his three later attempts to return to the Senate, he lost to Henry Clay in 1831 and 1848, and he lost to John J. Crittenden in 1842. So there you have it. Pretty interesting stuff regarding uh, Richard Mentor Johnson and his relationship with Julia Chin. Uh, we're going to get into the relationship in depth with him and Julia Chin uh, in part two. There's a very special, special thing coming up in part two regarding the relationship of Richard Mentor Johnson and Julia Chin, an enslaved woman who he also had two children with. So very interesting. We're going to get into that in part two. In 1829, the voters in Johnson's old district returned him to the House of Representatives where he remained during Jackson's two administrations. After chairing the Committee on Post Offices and Post Roads from 1829 to 1833, he served as Chairman of the Committee on Military Affairs from 1833 to 1837. An acknowledged power in the House, Johnson offered his services and advice to the administration on several occasions, albeit with noticeably less success than the more politically astute Martin Van Buren. Johnson was by nature a conciliator whose vehement rhetoric belied a tendency to avoid politically risky confrontations. In 1830, he urged Jackson to sign a bill to fund an extension of the National Road from Lexington to Maysville, Kentucky, warning in emphatic terms that 
you will crush your friends in Kentucky if you veto that bill. When the president proved intransigent, intransigent, he conceded that a tax to fund the Maysville Road would be worse than a veto. He failed to vote when the House sustained the veto on May 18th of 1830. An early aspirant for the 1832 Democratic presidential nomination, Johnson refocused his sights on the vice presidency after Jackson announced that he would seek a second term. New York labor leader Eli Moore and members of the Workingmen's Party supported Johnson for vice president. But Democratic strategists questioned the wisdom of adding him to the ticket. A correspondent of Navy Secretary John McClain noted that General Jackson is in feeble health and may not live to the end of his second term and questioned whether Colonel Johnson's caliber will answer for so high a station. Despite clear indications that Van Buren would replace Calhoun as the vice presidential candidate, however, Johnson abandoned his campaign only after Jackson's advisor, William B. Lewis, convinced him to do so. When on May 22nd of 1832, the Democratic Convention tapped Van Buren as Jackson's running mate on the first ballot, Johnson received only 26 votes from the Kentucky, Indiana, and Illinois delegations. A poor showing compared to Van Buren's 208 votes and the 49 votes of former House Speaker and Calhoun ally Philip P. Barber. Jackson and Van Buren then went on to win an easy victory in the general election. As early as April of 1833, Shortly after Jackson's new term began, Duff Green's political register reported that the western states are flooded with handbills nominating Colonel Richard M. Johnson of Kentucky as a candidate for the presidency in 1836. Johnson's friend William Emmons published the authentic biography of Colonel Richard M. Johnson in 1833, and Richard Emmons' play Tecumseh of the Battle of the Thames soon followed. A poem by Richard Emmons supplied the slogan that Johnson enthusiasts trumpeted in the 1836 and 1840 campaigns. Rumpsy Dumpsy, Colonel Johnson killed Tecumseh. The candidate delighted in these overblown celebrations of his military prowess boasting after a well-attended and well-received performance of Tecumseh that he had more friends than ever. But Johnson's following was based upon more than his military accomplishments, exaggerated though they were by his eager promoters. His efforts to abolish imprisonment for debt and to continue Sunday mail deliveries ensured him the support of the working men's movement in the urban centers and his hard money anti-bank fiscal policy appealed to the party's radical faction. He also enjoyed a strong following in the West, where Jackson's kitchen cabinet advisors Amos Kendall and Francis P. Blair considered him the only candidate who could neutralize Clay's overwhelming appeal. Party regulars understood, however, that in selecting Van Buren as his running mate in 1832, Jackson had named the diminutive New Yorker his successor. Johnson eventually acceded to the president's wishes with his usual equanimity, refusing to run as an opposition candidate when approached in 1834 by a coalition of disaffected Tennesseans led by David Crockett and John Bell. Blair and Kendall quietly changed their tactics in hopes of securing the vice presidential, no- vice presidential nomination for old, old Dick. Perhaps they hoped that Johnson would thus become the heir apparent to succeed Van Buren, or perhaps they merely recognized the futility of opposing old Hickory's will. 
Van Buren served as Jackson's right hand during his term as vice president, but this arrangement resulted more from his long-standing relationship with the president than from any commonly held assumptions regarding the role of the vice president. So that kind of wraps up this part one. However, I do want to just touch a little bit more on his early life. Um, you know, I already kind of went over this, but Richard Mentor Johnson was born in the settlement of Beargrass on the Kentucky frontier, which is present day Louisville on October 17th of 1780. He was the fifth of Robert and Jemima Suget Johnson's 11 children and the second of eight sons. So he was uh, one of 11 children. His brothers, John and Henry Johnson, survived him. His parents married in 1770. Robert Johnson, his father, purchased land in what is now Kentucky, but was then part of Virginia, from Patrick Henry and from James Madison. He had worked as a surveyor and was able to pick out good land. His wife, Jemima Suget, came from a wealthy and politically connected family. About the time of Richard's birth, the family moved to Bryan Station near present-day Lexington, Kentucky, in the Bluegrass region. This was a fortified outpost as there was much Native American resistance to white settlement. The Shawnee and Cherokee hunted in this area. Jemima Johnson, his mother, was remembered as among the community's heroic women because of what was told of her actions during Simon Gertie's raid on Bryan Station in August of 1782. According to later reports, with Indian warrior, warriors hidden in the nearby woods and the community short on water, she led the women to a nearby spring and the attackers allowed them to return to the fort with the water. Having the water helped the settlers beat off an attack made with flaming arrows. At the time, Robert Johnson was serving in the legislature in Richmond, Virginia, as he had been elected to represent Fayette County. Kentucky was part of Virginia, part of Virginia until 1792. Beginning in 1783, Kentucky was considered safe enough that settlers began to leave the fortified stations to establish farms. The Johnsons settled on the land Robert had purchased at Great Crossing. As a surveyor, he became successful through well-chosen land purchases and being in the region when he could take advantage of huge land grants. According to Miles Smith's doctoral thesis, Richard Mentor Johnson developed a cheery disposition and seems to have been a generally happy and content child. Richard lived on the family plantation until he was 16. In 1796, he was sent briefly to a local grammar school and then attended Transylvania University, the first college west of the Appalachian Mountains. While at the Lexington College, where his father was a trustee, he read law as a legal apprentice with George Nicholas and James Brown, later a U.S. Senator. I apologize. You could uh, hear George barking in the background a little bit. Uh... <laughs> George making his guest appearance, of course. So um, that's pretty much it. We're going to get into the whole marriage thing with uh, Julia Chin tomorrow in part two. And then, of course, we're going to get into uh, his vice presidency because we're all the way up to that 1836 election. So we're going to get into that and then the vice presidency and then the remainder of his life tomorrow in part two. Um, there's not going to be any bonus footage here at the end of part one, because I really don't have anything to show you here at the end of part one, but there's definitely bonus footage for the end of part two. I promise. <laughs> Some really great bonus footage. So uh, stay tuned, of course, for tomorrow for part two. I hope you enjoyed this part one. I uh, hope it was informative. Really great to be back. Excited to be doing these videos again, of course. Um, I appreciate everyone's patience. I appreciate everybody's support. We're over 7,000 subscribers here on YouTube now. Thank you so very much, everyone, for that. It's amazing. Uh, we haven't even technically been on this channel for a year yet. It's almost a year. Uh, it's 11 plus months, but 7,000 subscribers is way above my wildest dreams, to be honest with you. So uh, it's very, very uh, touching and very cool. 
Uh, and again, thank you for being patient. Uh, Henry and I just needed a couple weeks to unwind. Uh, you know, we've been going, going, going with baseball and everything else. Henry's birthday, of course, like I said, about 10 days ago. So um, it was just a lot easier for us to uh, take a little break for uh, two weeks and uh, refresh and regroup and come back, you know, hitting the ground running, as they say. So uh, thank you so much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this part one. Stay tuned for tomorrow. Part two, the conclusion of our ninth vice president of the United States in this vice presidential series installment looking at Richard Mentor Johnson. Thanks, guys. See you tomorrow.